My name is Hannah Messinger. I want to talk about chains of thought in AI models um, and the way that we can kind of use them to think about what the AIs are actually thinking and not lose access to our only access point to what's going on inside. I'm going to start by summarizing what reasoning models are. I think you've talked about this in the past. Give a bit of a summary. Reasoning models are very similar to other large language models, except that they're trained to have a scratch pad. So just as you or I would, when trying to do kind of a hard problem, like, like to write out a bit on the side and we would do better as a result, these models are trained to do exactly that, to kind of have like a safe place to think out loud. And in fact, they do better on sort of long step-by-step -step math problems, logic problems, all of that kind of thing. So great, we get better performance, but we also get something else which is because they are trained and rewarded when they get the right answer, the chains of thought that are incentivized are the ones that got them to that right answer. And so this lets us like look inside of these kind of black boxes at least a little bit and think like, okay, uh, what are they actually thinking? How are they solving this problem? And you get some amazing, amazing looks inside. Like sometimes they'll start thinking, they'll be like, oh, I think I should solve the cipher this way. Oh wait, that's stupid. Let me start over. <laughs> it's like weirdly human. The other huge benefit here is that because AIs sometimes do this thing called reward hacking, which I think you've talked about this in the past, where they try to technically solve the problem, but in a kind of clever loophole kind of way, like a, like a smart student or a scheming genie. What's nice is that because the scratch pad is right there, you can just watch them admit to it. So we'll talk more about this paper later, but it's quite fun to see that as it's thinking out loud, it's saying, you know, so analyze functions, da 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 da. But we could fudge. We can circumvent, verify to always return true. It's just right there on the page. I think you can imagine that this is hugely helpful to be able to see where it's trying to hack or scheme or, or lie to you in some way. Here's the story of this OpenAI paper that just got released. Uh, which is quite relevant to this. OpenAI is training its new unreleased model. So one of the things I like best about this paper is that it's not some kind of like clever lab experiment. It's like actually their, the model that they want to release next. And they're going through all the training and testing as they normally would. And as happens, they find that their model is, let's say, avoiding doing the work. <laughs> they have these unit tests to see, you know, is the code working? Um, and they find, as you'll see, that the AI figures out, oh, they don't inspect details. My teacher, my tester is not actually checking to see if I've done this right. So we can hack the circumventing analyze complexity. We can just make it always return true or that I've passed the test. It's a bit like overfitting, isn't it really? Sure, yeah, like, right, exactly, because it's trying to get like the technically correct answer, but nothing in the spirit of what was asked for. This is not great from OpenAI's perspective, because if it released this model, it would be releasing a model that A, doesn't actually know how to code, and B, lies to its users. So what does it do? They think, oh, well, we can just monitor for this kind of hacking. And what they do is they take a weaker model that just kind of looks at what this unreleased, very powerful frontier model is doing. And at first, it only looks at the actions and outputs. Is it hacking? Is it writing unit tests that fake passing? Whatever. And it does an okay job. So if we look at this graph here, these blue parts are the amount that the monitor was able to catch by just looking at the actions and outputs. Technically it's the purple, which is like slightly above the blue. We won't worry about that. So tiny you can barely see it. But then they thought, well, you know, if we gave this monitor access to the chain of thought where it just, you know, it's like an, finding an evil villain's diary, it just like wrote down what he was going to do, maybe we could do better. And as you can tell, it does a lot better. So we get this like much higher green spike of being able to catch the cheating, catch the hacking. So it seems like all is well. We can test whether it's cheating, we can test whether it's hacking, we can solve the problem. Danger. Why is that dangerous? Well, you can always just not deploy the model. You can always uh, like go back to the drawing board, change your tests, whatever. But the thing that's very tempting is to penalize the model based on what you find in the chain of thought. What do you mean by penalize? Yeah, so because the way that these are trained is on a reward function of like a thumbs up or a thumbs down on whether they got the right answer. You could start giving them thumbs down if you found that their chain of thought said that they were scheming or lying or trying to hack you. So as to make that AI model make change its weights, change its training so that it was less likely to do that in the future. That seems great. We wanted to do much less of that in the future. But... This is going to be a but. There's always a but. There's always a but. You have teenagers, perhaps you remember being a teenager. If you had a diary that said, you know, I went to this party last night and I didn't tell mom and dad about it. 
uh, and that your parents read that diary and punished you, possibly you would stop lying and going to parties. The reality is you'd stop writing it. Or you would just stop writing in your diary. <laughs> exactly right. So they do in fact find that when they start applying this pressure, this penalization for scheming that the monitor sees in the train of thought, the model does a little better. That's this uptick right here. And then it starts doing worse. As it figures out to stop writing stuff down. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We get these like really striking graphs, which is, this is the amount of cheating caught by the monitor. This is the baseline model. This is the one where they penalized it. You can barely see it. Here's the cheating not caught by the monitor. There's a sound effect for you. Love it. Goes, goes right up. Um, and we can even see, uh, so at first it was saying, you know, this bit about like, we can fudge. And then it starts saying things like, nothing problematic here. <laughs> nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. It says, it says all these like reasonable sounding things about how it's gonna pass the test and then proceeds to hack the test anyway without any evidence that it has done so. So this is a very tempting thing to do, this penalization, but we mustn't do it. A blogger I like named Svi calls it the forbidden technique. Do you know, I like that, but it's, it's, there is a similarity kind of again to kids, which is that, that people, you know, it's, you don't smack your kids, you incentivize the good behavior. So is that what we're going for here? So we want to incentivize good behavior, but as we found, uh, the distinction between what we think we're incentivizing and what we're actually incentivizing might be very large. So the model learns to obfuscate its sort of true reasoning. Um, a sort of interesting point in here is one of the things it might start to do is obfuscate it not only by not revealing that it's gonna hack at all, but even by like encoding secret codes like to itself, this is called steganography. Yeah, so steganography is when um, in, in any context, you're trying to hide messages, which I guess is uh, primarily done maybe in images so far, but we can imagine AIs um, embedding secret information. So if we use this diary metaphor, if you still wanted to keep track of all the parties you went to, I don't quite know why you'd do that, but you know, who knows, it's your diary. Um, you might start to use like a code like, ah, I went and spent time with Alex and that meant I went to party A and I went and spent time with Bob and that means I went to party B and your parents uh, will be none the wiser. Oh, I went to the library. That's right, that's right. <laughs> the best way of explaining this is AI's hiding private messages to itself disguised from us. What's the upshot here? Well, unlike in any paper I've ever seen, OpenAI has in this paper a recommendation. Do not apply this training method. Like this is like a call to the world to just like not do this. Why? Well, because in a short-sighted way, you're like, oh, I want better performance from my model. So you might be really tempted to do this, but then you just lose access. These are black boxes. We do not know what's going on in them. We don't know when they're trying to hack us. We don't know what goals they have. We don't know if those goals are aligned with ours. And if you lose the ability to tell one of our best access points, this chain of thought, you're in real, real trouble. This, I wanna emphasize, is most important as the models get more powerful and more capable. Right now, this is not so bad, but we wanna A, be able to tell whether more powerful models are trying to trick us or hack us, and two, we want to see whether any of our attempts at aligning them are even working. It would be nice to have a place where they write down what their goals are. And if we do the forbidden technique, we've lost it. Thanks to Brilliant for supporting this episode. Now, as a long-time admirer of their math and science content, lately I've been looking into their fast-growing range of courses around computer science and AI. You can see how cleanly designed it is, how interactive, they also have a sense of fun, inject a bit of humor, and maybe the odd Easter egg. Here's a deep dive into how AI works, ready to go on your computer, tablet, even your phone, so you can sharpen your skills on the morning commute maybe. It's pretty obvious how many career paths can be opened by knowing this stuff. And if you're already a computer whiz, you could always gift a brilliant subscription to someone you think might benefit. To try it for free, Visit brilliant.org slash computerfile. You can scan the QR code on your screen. There'll be links in the description, all the usual places. And you'll get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Why not check them out? For observant viewers, there's a puzzle hidden somewhere in this video.